Hi, my name is Michael Nunley. I am the founder of Omen Comics and the co-founder of Revelation Comics. I write Omen, uh, Gallows Men, uh, Dragon Girl, Albina Warrior, Dark Oracles, and uh, Seder for Revelation Comics. Uh, you can find us uh, at, at uh, Comics Omen, and you can find us at Revelation uh, Comic, and um, you can find us at, on uh, Patreon at Omen Comics. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Steve Sellers. Uh, I'm the uh, writer and creator of Blitz. Um, I'm also the uh, co-creator of uh, White Road and Michael Nero, as well as Guardians of the Lame. And uh, yeah, and you can uh, find me at uh, Shadewing and at Revelation Comic uh, on Twitter. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined by two very talented individuals. One is the president of Owen Comics, as well as Royal Relation Comics. And another is a returning guest who is also a writer and a very talented person who's on right. He was back on earlier, a couple of months back, talking about Dragon Girl at Bina Warrior. We're joined today by the ever-talented Steve Sellers and, of course, Michael Nunley. How are you guys doing today? Oh, we're doing great, man. Thanks for having us on. Life is great. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. My name is Michael Nunley. I'm here to talk about Omen Comics, a little bit about what's coming up, discuss where our comics are at, that type of thing. Yeah, I'm uh, Steve Sellers. I'm mainly here to talk about the Omen Comics that I write, which is uh, mainly White Druid and Michael Nero and Guardians of Elaine, as well as Revelation Comics, particularly my uh, superhero comic Blitz. We may along the way slip in that we also do some writing for Rain Cross Press called Blood World. Well, this is great. So we have a lot of content to go over. Not a lot of time to do it, unfortunately, but that's the way interviews are. Regarding your comic writing process, we'll talk about being a president as well, Steve, why you wanted to create those companies. Sure. What is the hardest part about writing? The beginning, the middle, or the end of your process? Middle. <laughs> Definitely middle. I usually know more or less the basic idea of what I want. I usually know where to start it. I usually know more or less where I'm aiming towards, even if I don't have like an exact specific thing. Sometimes it'd be a bit of work getting from point A to point B, especially if like you're right in the middle and you're trying to make it engaging and not trying to drop in things that are extraneous, those kinds of things. You kind of have to work those out. One of those things you have to get through and you get through it, go to the next one. It really is just a matter of knowing your characters, trusting your characters to do what they need to do and then trusting in yourself to be able to know what the next piece is and how to connect the dots. I tend to actually start at the end of the story and work my way back. I usually get a good idea uh, exactly how the end scenario is going to be set up and who's going to be there and what's going to be going on and then I work it back. How the heck did they get there type of thing. So I suppose the most difficult part for me is often where to start the story. Once I get that beginning done, the middle kind of fills itself in when I'm doing the outline for the story. It's a definitely working in reverse process. I know what I want to accomplish with it, and it's a matter of trying to figure out how to get there. So then let's talk about Omen Comics and Revelation Comics. So Steve, as the president here, how did you come up with the company and why did you want to create these companies? It really all started with Omen Comics. Mike brought me in when we were doing a new website called the Chico Comics page. And so I was kind of brought in to write White Druid and Michael Nero at the start of it. And then eventually, you know, we started building the whole omen verse mike knew what he wanted to do with that we eventually kind of realized that there were things that we wanted to tell that didn't fit into the omen verse we kind of created revelation as an umbrella for basically everything that the in-house team at omen wanted to do that did not fit into the omen verse uh, as established by mike and, and the rest of us my whole idea of it was that this would be for passion projects this would be for kind of experimental type of comics things that you know, we don't typically do in our other titles. So, you know, you have Mike go, going off and doing a Viking grimdark horror stuff, and you have me doing superhero stuff. And our artist, Tozan Awasika, decided to do a Nigerian war comic. It's basically a diverse line with the idea you know, of telling the kinds of stories that, you know, the Omen verse just will not let us do because of the nature of that universe. As I recall, it was specifically with forming uh, Revelation Comics that Steve had this character Blitz and this world he was talking about maybe doing prose. I totally hit him up. I was like, hey, man, what about doing that comic with us? And it was actually figuring out how to do that logistically that kind of led to the formation of Revelation Comics. The name Revelation Comics comes from, an or I believe, an organization. It's or one of the factions in my 
my universe, yeah. Yeah, as far as Omen Comics goes, there's a little bit of a backstory there. I got hired, I used hired in quotations, <laughs> to do a comic. The guy ended up being, the idea was we were going to do this Kickstarter and everybody was going to get paid from that. And the guy just kept going artist after artist after artist because he wasn't paying anybody up front at all. And consequently, turns out by the time I had written three issues for the guy, he wasn't actually all that serious about making a comic in general. I kind of actually helped him create a character called Omen, a universe of other characters based on characters I had already had together. And I told him, all right, man, well, I'm walking with the rights to the characters we did. I actually named the company Omen Comics to spite him, naming it after the character that I had created for him there. <laughs> and I always used to think it was because he loved Damien. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you can always love a devil infused child of scamp that he is, you know. <laughs> right. Always fun times um, or end of times, one of those two. Looking at what you created, the world of Omen Comics here, what has been the reaction from those that have been following your various series throughout? In general, the reaction to those that have actually read the books have been pretty good. I suppose our, our only real issue is really the audience. We kind of jumped in and started running without really building up an audience first. That's part of the reason why the readership is as low as it is. For the 40, 50 people that have read the comics, I'm going to say that they genuinely really like it. They like what's going on. They like the feel of the comic. They like the art. Uh, it's been pretty positive. Mm -hmm. I know we've reviewed pretty well from what I've seen. I've been done pretty well for so far with the characters that we have. The people that tend to follow us are usually pretty loyal. So I really appreciate everybody who's done that. Even though you hit the ground running with your, your various series that you have here, it's better to have content than to have nothing at all. It is true. You definitely got to put yourself out there. You know, you want to get into making comics. The key part is making a comic. <laughs> There's definitely something to the whole building your audience, really taking the time to get people interested in what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. You know, you got to sell the stage and the sizzle, that kind of an idea. In regards to the very, the series that you have here, and, and Steve, we'll, we'll ask this question of you here. Tell us what mm -hmm. White Druid is about. White Druid and Michael Nero. Basically, the idea behind this is that Michael Nero is a cult detective. He is kind of like the Sherlock Holmes of magic, more or less. He is also the apprentice of a 5,000 or so year old god from the Irish pantheon, uh, Lu Oshi. He is the White Druid in the title. It's kind of like if Holmes and Watson were also apprentice uh, student relationship and also kind of like an adopted son relation. Nero in many ways is a self-destructive character. He is a character who has this power called the third sight, which allows him to see spirits and demonic presences, other planes, all these other planes of existence, and he can't control it. So, you know, he's always seeing like these Lovecraftian things around the corner and he can't do a whole lot about it. And that's why he needs Lou because Lou is the one who has been kind of teaching him to cope with this ability and, you know, teaching him magic in, in order to deal with the things that he finds. There is a lot of that, but at the same time, Nero is a very abrasive person. He is bluntly honest to a fault. He likes to be very snarky and very irritating. A lot of it is about him trying to do the right thing, but he's trying to do it against his own nature, which is often uh, very difficult to deal with. So then how about Blitz? I saw the images you sent in, and they look beautiful, by the way. So I love the art. So we'll talk Talk about your teams as well. Talk about Blitz, because that seemed like a really interesting concept. The idea that I had with Blitz, and I came up with this character in the early 2000s or so, came out of a online role-playing game that I was doing. And actually, this character pretty much just jumped out of nowhere. 18, 19-year-old speedster who finds an object in a junkyard, which has all of these things that have been abandoned from various superhero battles. And it's all collecting dust. And she just finds one one day, and it turns her into a speedster. The thing with her though, is she has the heart of a hero. She really wants to do the right thing. But the thing is, she has no clue how to do it. She does not have a uh, Barry Allen to teach her how to use her powers. She has to figure these things out by herself. She ends up partnering with somebody who is probably not the best influence. And I call him the devil on her shoulder. That is Night Spider Roland Travis. He is a former criminal. He is a gentleman thief who is under a mad curse and it forces him to either do good or he suffers like constant spiritual pain. So he's trying to find a line between 
who he is and who he wants to be. And so he decides to take, for his own reasons, Flits under his wing, teaching her, because he's also a trained ninja as well as a gentleman thief. So he knows all the skills of being a hero. He knows how to fight. He knows how to infiltrate organizations and get the kinds of things that he wants from them. But what he doesn't know how to do is be a hero. I just love the idea of these two characters who are very, very different, being forced to work together in a city where really there are not a whole lot of heroic presence for a while. And it's for reasons due to the universe that uh, I'll get into into the series itself. I just think that that core dynamic is really where a lot of it comes from. Since we last talked, Michael, what's going on with Dragon Girl Albino Warrior? Last time we talked, the comic was doing a Kickstarter. That was not successful. The comic was still published. You find it at the Wicked store on KDP as well as Global Comics. The story is still going on. I'm actually in the middle of writing issue number three for the series. We're still going to keep going. One of the things, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, about how uh, we didn't really take the time to build up our audience. Really, I think that is part of the reason why we have not had a successful Kickstarters as of late. What our thought was, after Dragon Girl Albino Warrior was unsuccessful, we were going to take some time, build our audience, get caught up with things, really get our feet uh, back under us again before everything gets rolling again. But we are going to be putting out about one comic a year for the next two years. The very next one coming out is a, a Revelation comic called SAD. It stands for Sad and Desperate. That's another one from our artist uh, Tosin Awasika. That one has like a Nigerian mythology. It has conspiracy in it. It has monsters in it. That story just goes crazy. It is all over the place. I actually scripted that for him. That was a lot of fun. I believe that's the next one uh, coming out from Revelation Comics. And then with Omen Comics, a year after that, we got a really big comic coming out called Dark Oracles. That is going to be a 56 pager and it's actually going to be a 23 page story from Steve and a 23 page story from me. Wow. The purpose of the title is really to tell all the backstories and side stories in Omen Comics that just don't fit well into the flow of the story or kind of take us out of the pacing of the thing to tell. And so Dark Oracles uh, helps fill in all the little gaps, lets you know all the little backstories and stuff. Dark Oracles are Rod Serling slash Crypt Keeper character. And that is the Egyptian god Thoth. And he is somebody who is obsessed with getting information and reporting back to Ra about, you know, the various things that he finds in time and space. The way that this connects to Dark Oracles, he's a character that shows up in Guardians of a Lamb as well. Or early on in the first issue, I believe he shows. We're kind of giving him more or less this title in order to breathe a little bit. And he is kind of like uh, the one that's doing the bookends uh, with both of the uh, stories that we're doing in the middle of that. Um, Mike, I believe, is doing a story called uh, The Chronicles of Nod, but I'll let him uh, talk about that if he wants to. The one that I'm doing is called, for the first issue, is called uh, Rose of Seleucia, which is the trial of Nazarin of Parthia. And Nazarin is one of the main characters uh, from Guardians. She is a princess of an actual historical land called Parthia, and it takes place somewhere like in the vicinity of Iran and Iraq, that kind of area. There's not a whole lot that's really known about that particular culture. So I had a little bit of room to kind of play with that, but really the idea is how Nazarin uh, character got started, how she became the person that she is in Guardians, some of the things in her past, uh, her regrets <laughs> because of things that happened in the story, what causes her to go to Jerusalem or where we see her in Guardians 1. With Chronicles of Nod, to make the Omen verse, I had to combine the myths and folklore of the world into one universe. <laughs> That's actually more difficult than it may sound. All of the gods in every mythology believe they're the only gods there are. I'm so trying to get them all to fit into the same universe without contradicting each other took a lot of work. I used the Christian, a version of the Christian God as the, as the central figure in the story. Now granted, this is nothing like the actual Christian God. All of these characters are totally fictional. Basically, uh, I had to rewrite the story of how, we call him El in that story, how El came into power over all the other gods. And then particularly the beginning of the story with Adam and Eve, the start of man. I particularly wanted to explore Cain kills Abel in the original story there. But why? What made Cain so different from Abel that he was a murderer and Abel was not? I really wanted to explore that kind of stuff. The title of the story that I'm doing in Dark Oracles there, that first story is what separates us from them. And it's really about what makes the Cain family different. Mythology and, and religion are, are obviously rather interesting. And mythology is more interesting than religion, in my opinion, but I like yeah. history, so that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to mythology and comics, though, why is this so fascinating to each of you when you create your works? I personally have loved mythology since I was a boy. I got into it with stuff like Jason and the Argonauts, and particularly, I believe it was in 1982. 
2, I think it was, that Clash of the Titans came out. That one really, really inspired me. I mean, after watching Clash of the Titans, I immediately started going to the library, both the city library and the ones at school, getting out any mythology books they had and just devouring it all. I just loved the whole idea of these super-powered beings and even regular people just doing fantastic things. Uh, you know, there was magic and fantasy involved. I just, I was fascinated by the whole thing. And, and honestly, that love of that type of story is honestly what drug me into comic books. The very first comic I ever purchased was a Mighty Thor comic. Yeah, it was something similar to me uh, as well. I do remember Clash of the Titans when I was young, but I think a lot of it really was that I discovered the books on Greek mythology when I was fairly young. There was a trip to England that I took and I got a number of mythology books and I kind of absorbed those and then just kind of reading Marvel's version of Thor and Hercules and things like that. So I think uh, mythology and on some level has always kind of been on the brain to various degrees. Degrees. My eyes were really expanded with things like Sandman, which heavily delved into various mythologies as well. And it kind of showed you what was possible. We've kind of gotten to the point where our entire universe is based on just about every form of mythology you know, you can probably find. It also allows people that are interested or maybe haven't heard of various mythologies to kind of look into it themselves if they're interested. Right. I feel like I should mention, though, that while it is a blend of mythologies, there are some differences. Omen Comics has a lot of apocalyptic themes. The whole first major part of the story is an apocalyptic event, as well as with me being a huge horror fan, there are horror elements in it. Sci-fi is not just mythology. The heroes in the story, however, with the exception of Dragon Girl, Abina War, are genuinely broken people, just heroes despite themselves. What are three things that you are proud of that you've accomplished? And what are three things that you were looking at accomplishing? I'm really proud of the fact that we've put out as many comics as we have. I feel like uh, over the process, I kind of dove into the deep end and then taught myself how to swim as far as making comics goes. I'm really coming into my own now, and I'm, I'm really starting to be proud of my work that I'm putting out. I'm really uh, starting to be confident in the quality of our books. Me and Steve are going to be starting the fourth season of our podcast. I'm really excited about that. We've got 70 plus episodes uh, recorded. We've put a lot of work into those. I feel like we've really reached a mile marker with this. We finally really uh, accomplished something big with it. Definitely getting as many books out as I have. I definitely take a certain pride in White Druid and Michael Nero, number one. I mean, I feel like I've gotten better as a writer since then, but that book got a lot of really good reception. And I really feel like that kind of got the rest of it going. So I have a certain amount of pride in that. I would say Blitz number one for sure, because that's my baby. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that is the book that I would say is probably for me the most personal. I'm glad to finally, you know, see the first issue out there. I'm looking forward to getting the other ones done. My latest work I've been trying to do is just getting you know, the later issues of those written. That's something I'm really looking forward uh, to finally getting out with once that's done. Beyond that, I would also say Guardians of the Land number one. That was a really tough script uh, to get out because there involved a lot of research. It involved getting a lot of different characters together. It involved trying to, to, to figure out things, what Romans would use for a latrine <laughs> yeah, as an equivalent of a latrine, that, that kind of thing. I feel like it came together really, really well. I think that uh, Taz and Aloisika did an amazing job on the art. I think he got the exact look that I wanted to for Jerusalem. So that came out really well. Um, so I'm really happy with that issue particularly. What's the most misunderstood aspect about being a writer that people maybe that aren't in the industry make assumptions of? Hmm. <laughs> we both did a hum there. Yeah, <laughs> it was like, where do you even want to start with that? Um, right. Yeah, I would say probably one thing is that it's like to people that haven't written, it seems like it's either a really easy job or it's like something nobody can do. I think it's in the middle of that <laughs> because you can start off somewhere where you're not that good and you gradually get better. You get the cobwebs out after a while. My earliest stuff when I was 15 was garbage, <laughs> absolute garbage. But I, I like to think that working at it and constantly working at it and continuing to get better and you know knowing how to use the visual storytelling elements and, and all of these other things, gradually, you know, I feel like I've gone to a place where at least I can put myself out there and not, you know, feel like I have to laugh at myself. <laughs> and I think it's true for most people as well. I mean, if you put enough time, work and effort and you try to understand how it works and, you know, you're able to put your ego aside, you know, enough to see your work, you know, as objectively as you reasonably can. Um, if you can do those things, I think it is possible to become a better writer, even if you're not at the beginning. Definitely. I guess I would say that one of the biggest things I come across as a horror writer is the assumption that you are like what you write. 
<laughs> you oh know, God, uh, I hope not. <laughs> right? <laughs> like this is uh, the guy that created Patrick O'Leary, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I've dealt with that a lot in particular, especially with scenes like in Gallowsman Two. Uh, there's some very graphic uh, violence in there. I guess my point is that being able to imagine something to put it into a story does not reflect who the author is as a person. For instance, I, I don't believe that all people who write romance novels are particularly romantic all the time. They don't necessarily have to be. I mean, I think about that uh, Jack Nicholson as that uh, romance writer in that movie where his whole perception of romance was, well, I think of a man and then I take away uh, accountability. Reason and, and accountability. Reason and accountability. Yeah, you know, like that kind of thing. Just that you can write really dark and twisted stories and it doesn't actually reflect you as a person. I think the, the conception that you are what you write is really just kind of backwards. <laughs> it's overblown. Yeah. I mean, so you need a certain spark of yourself in order to get into the character. Beyond a certain point, you know, they go into differently different directions that are not you. And you have to write a lot of different perspectives that you don't share. I reject that as well. My search history does not reflect yeah. who I am as a person. <laughs> <laughs> Just going to say, yeah, any, any government that happens to be watching and or listening to these interviews, don't pry into anyone's search history that are writers or creative people. It just, it's not going to look good. Right. <laughs> Looking at the fact that social media plays a huge aspect, not only in promotion, but in reach and in interaction with fans there, how are you both trying to improve your social media reach with the comics that you've created? Personally, we kind of have a strategy that we've developed for these next couple of years where we're trying to get our feet back under us. And one of the things is really to interact with people. Me and Steve are part of what's being sold with Omen Comics and Revelation mm -hmm. Comics. And, you know, having our personality, social media is really important. One of the things we're focusing on is really to get people interested in the books that are already out. We haven't really delved a whole lot into really getting people interested in 11 books we got already. <laughs> That's one big thing uh, we've been focusing on uh, with social media in particular to build a fan base and to get people interested. And we both have other podcasts that we do. So we have Omen Revelations where we do push our own stuff as well. But a lot of people are going to have to kind of almost look for it because if you're interested in it, you're going to follow it. That's kind of the way it is. I have other things that I do for Comic Crusaders, other projects, and I try as much as possible to like slip in a little bit about our work here. I do uh, sloppy spoilers with our partners on Red Cross Press. Usually they do a pretty good job of plugging us. Also, I do Cinema Crusaders with the many of the same people. So that gives us a bit of a cross-section to, to reach for in addition to the other things we do. Sloppy Spoilers and the Cinema Crusaders are both off the Chronic Crusaders podcast network. Usually Sloppy Spoilers comes on periodic Tuesdays. And then Cinema Crusaders is technically supposed to be most Fridays, but sometimes, you know, things kind of pop up in the middle, but usually it's every Friday. I'm a big horror guy. In fact, because of my writing and stuff I talk about on social media, that's a lot of people tend to know me for that. I'm actually on a, another podcast where we do kind of an infotainment type of thing. It's called Countless Corpses Podcast, but mm -hmm. we definitely count the bodies. <laughs> we dig into horror movies and we talk about behind the scenes and making of stuff. That really helps with the spreading the word. You know, it gets people interested in me as a writer and in into horror important i think that's uh, one of the things that's going to draw people into at least my book specifically how are you trying to set yourself apart as creative people on these shows i think when it comes to sloppy spoilers i'm generally assumed to be like i wouldn't want to say the fairest but i would say like the one that tends to be most optimistic and among the more inclined to give something a chance whereas the other three um are very strongly opinionated and will often dig into things a little bit more than i will i'm usually a little bit more laid back in that respect and i think it kind of sets me apart a bit from from those guys and besides they do that stuff a lot better than me anyway so i think it kind of works out i'm not really sure uh uh, what I do that actually sets me apart. I tend to try to be as amicable as possible with people. I don't want to argue with stuff. I don't mind having a conversation about something. But one of the things that I really bring to the situation that I think maybe sets me apart is I know a lot of the behind the scenes stuff and making mm -hmm. of uh, content about things. So that's something I can really bring to the show that uh, that that you know, is is different than, say, just coming on and talking about a movie. You know, I could talk about how it was made and what went into the story and all of that. At what point are we good enough? Um, wow, that's, that's well, that is a really tough question. Yeah, <laughs> go with the hard one, why don't you? Here's kind of the problem I had. I think you get you get too satisfied with anything. You start getting complacent, and then you start 
getting not so good. So my feeling is it's like probably when you retire and I don't feel like either of us are anywhere near close to uh, being actually done with uh, making comics or writing or anything like that. So I would just say, yeah, I think enough is kind of like a trap and I would try to avoid that. At the same time, you don't want to beat yourself constantly for like a misplaced comma. So I think that there's a reasonable balance between, okay, I can take pride in things that I know have done well for me and that people seem to like, et cetera. But I I think that confining yourself with complacency is basically the death of creativity. And, and I try to avoid that. For me, I read through the comics several times before um, I even turn it over to my editor. For me, I wait until I'm impressed. I have to look, be able to look at it and say, you know what? I like this. This is good. And until I reach that point, I don't even give it to my editor. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Hmm. Wow, that's a really tough one. I think it's always like the first book that really has an impact on you, or at least that kind of would be for me. And I think for me, it was reading the Dragonlance Chronicles because that was the book that made me finally decide, yeah, I'm going to give this writing thing a chance because I like what was in that book. I just love the characters in it. And I just felt like, okay, I can try to create my own characters and, you know, tell my own story and kind of see where it goes. So I would say, you know, that would definitely be one of those. The time I first realized language really had power was when I tried to imagine say a noun that didn't have some other connotation to it other than just the word or definition itself. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Yeah, I would probably say, you know, do what you love. If you do something that you have a passion for, that's going to sustain you. I mean, really, I'm not in the business of comics for the money. It's really because I love storytelling. And it's because I love creating things. And it's because I love sharing these things. I think some things you have to get into it because you have genuine fire and genuine passion for the material and for the medium and whatnot. And I think with comics, I've always had that. That's like a piece of advice that I've kind of seen like a couple of times. My grandfather used to say that my job was my hobby. <laughs> I would say that's probably why I would go with that. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Um, in terms of literary influences, it's without a doubt Chris Claremont. I kind of discovered him when I was around eight years old and when I started really getting into Marvel from uh, a little bit of DC. I think his work spoke to me on a level that I don't think too many others ever have before or since. And I think a lot of it was just that he had these really fascinating characters. I feel like he was trying to say something about acceptance. You know, I felt like his characters um, were going through the same kind of experiences that I understood. And I think a lot of that is just um, the outcast nature of the X-Men. It's just such a wide appeal. The way he did it, I feel like really spoke very much uh, to my own experiences. And I think because of that, that was one of the main reasons I started getting into writing and also into writing comics specifically. And honestly, I've written an entire series of articles about Claremont as a writer. And I think a lot of it is just me kind of giving back, you know, just because I feel like I was inspired along this whole path of from reading that. Beyond that, you, you generally like go with the, the similar answers, you know, you know, my family, um, you know, of course, is, is always inspirational in various ways. And there are a lot of people that you know, you kind of stand on in order to get anywhere. But yeah, I would say in terms of, in terms of creatively, definitely uh, Claremont. One of my biggest influences, you know, speaking of Stan Lee, was Stan Lee himself. I looked at several publishers and they had these universes full of characters, but uh, Stan Lee had a good part in creating a lot of the characters of Marvel. I wanted to, that to be me at some point. I wanted to be the guy that created a universe of characters. And uh, that was part of the inspiration for even starting uh, Omen Comics. From a professional standpoint, you both are creative and talented people and you've been creating comics and have done journalism and other works as well too. So professionally, you are successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I'm going to say yes, but not necessarily based on how my business is done, but based on my contentment. I believe that success in life is based on being content with where you're at and what you're doing. And in that respect, um, I'm doing exactly what I love doing. I'm doing what I've always wanted to be doing, and I'm happy doing it, regardless of how it turns out. I, I think I would agree with that. I would say creatively, I'm definitely happy. You know, just getting just getting book published is an achievement. I've done several with Mike. I have a short story that came out uh, last year, a fantasy short story called Blood and Ashes for um, ASAP uh, Imagination. 
I mean, that that was one I was really proud to get out there. You know, we're both going to be doing uh, Blood World, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. I know Mike's done some really great stuff with with the one that he's done. And uh, and I've been starting to see, you know, images back uh, from um, Jeff Bracey, who's our art director, for like designs for my characters. And I can't wait to see where that goes. So, yeah, I would say, yeah, as long as you're kind of happy with what you're creatively doing. Yeah, it's like, are we making tons of money? Are we raking in the dough? And you know, being at every single con in the world. No, but that doesn't matter. Uh, I think what matters is is the creative process, you know, getting things done and working on projects that satisfy you and make you happy. And I think that we've, we've done that. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? It's always like a step back uh, leading to a step forward. I think um, failure is a teaching moment and it is a learning moment. And like, I'm not the biggest fan of The Last Jedi, but I like this line from it. Failure, the greatest teacher is. And that's true, (laughs) you know, because you have to learn from where something didn't work in order to do better. And I feel like with the Kickstarters, for example, we may not have been having hugely successful Kickstarter campaigns, but I think that the results that we have been getting on the last couple of them have been better than the ones that which we started and we started making mistakes on it. I feel like as long as you're kind of learning and growing, you know, eventually you're going to get to the point where it will work. That I think is the important thing. A line from John Luke Picard, it is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. So, you know, sometimes failure is completely, you know, not necessarily within your control. And in those cases, you just, you know, kind of grin it, you know, bear it and kind of move on with it. And bonus points for the Picard quote. <laughs> I want to say, just building off of what you said there, Steve, experience is the hardest teacher. First comes the test and then comes the lesson. We've really been able to take the times that the times that we have failed. And I think we've been able to come back from it. I think that we've been able to really keep fighting. In, in my opinion, as long as I have, I like to say, left it all in the ring, I'm all right with failing. The younger generation is looking at your work and they become inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer, a creative person in some way, shape, or form, or maybe something else entirely creative that maybe they don't know about just yet. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I would say by doing the best work they can, putting it out there, you know, trying to show how it can be done, uh, putting an honest commitment into the work, treating people well. I mean, just trying to be a good person. I think that in itself you know, can be very inspiring. I would say as long as they're like, you know, putting their most into the ring and, you know, trying to do it ethically and just the best way they possibly can, I think that's really the best that they can do. If your life was a comic book or movie, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, geez. <laughs> I don't know. I don't feel like my life would be that interesting <laughs> as a comic. <laughs> I don't know. Slouching into mundanity. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, yeah, I tend to like video game soundtracks, so um, I would probably go for Final Fantasy oh, yeah. uh, 7 or 8 soundtrack by Nobuo Uematsu. <laughs> I, I can get behind that, especially Seth and Roth's uh, anthem that comes in, you know, as, as Monday approaches. I suppose I would call it no dead ends. I've learned in this process that I have come up with like four or five absolutely perfect business plans and they have all failed and I've had to come up with something else. The point is that all those dead ends I reached were not actually dead ends. They were just a different place to turn. I suppose I would say that. I mean, I, I have tried uh, many things in my life. Uh, I, I, I tried uh, I tried getting into mixed martial arts. I tried football. I tried playing in a band. Uh, I, did, I did lots of different stuff. I think really that no dead ends thing really defines it. As far as soundtracks go, I'm going to say you're probably going to have to go with 80 hair metal or something (laughs) so we got one end of the spectrum of hair metal to awesome video game soundtrack music this was a win of a question i like (laughs) well i do hate to say it steve and michael but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking i want to thank you so much for coming on the show oh man i was glad to be here Glad, glad to talk to you yeah yeah it was a lot of fun For those that want to support you and, of course, find Omen Comics and, of course, Revelation Comics and everything else that you've created, where can we find you and how can we support you online? You can support uh, Omen Comics, Revelation Comics, and Omen Revelations podcast um, at uh, Patreon slash Omen Comics. 
Um, we got all kinds of tiers there. Uh, we're offering all kinds of, you get inside information, early access to episodes, uh, Patreon exclusive episodes, uh, insider videos. Uh, you're guaranteed to get uh, all of our comics in both digital and physical format, even if they're not successful. Uh, it's really a great place to do it. Uh, as far as finding us, uh, we're on Twitter at uh, Comics Omen and on Facebook at uh, Omen Comics. Yeah, for me on Twitter, it's uh, Shadewing, um, at Shadewing, it's uh, one word, and then uh, Revelation Comic, one word as well. Um, and I'll also point out, uh, since we didn't mention it, uh, we also have the Fellowship of the D20, which is our uh, D&D group. Basically, it's uh, the two of us, Nemesis from uh, Rain Cross Press, our friend uh, Greg Greenland or DM Neff and Freak Girl who helps him out. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You'd, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, which is youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.